looking to Europe and dealing with the issues involved in the Eurozone briefly um, regarding the United Kingdom and Europe. Um, there has been great unrest in the past week, uh, especially within the Conservative Party uh, at the present, concerning the United Kingdom's relationship with Europe. Many Conservative backbenchers uh, have shown their displeasure um, and have at pulling out of the European Union while Prime Minister Cameron himself is trying to maintain a united front support for Europe. My question for all of you academic student leaders is, considering the recent YouGov poll, which claimed that 52% of people want to leave Europe and that 31% want to stay in, do you think this government under Prime Minister Cameron has underestimated how strongly the majority of the electorate feel about being tied to the European Union? I mean, I have to say that I think the song and dance we've seen from Eurosceptic Tory MPs and the entire Conservative Party in the past few weeks has been a sideshow when the most important decisions about the future of the European financial system are being made in Europe. I think it is a derogation of duty to um, focus on issues which do not have any realistic political potential attached. Uh, the idea that we are going to unilaterally, unilaterally pull out of the European Union, I think, is largely farcical, certainly in the short term, and when there are far more important decisions to be made about the entire right. financial crisis. Now, ben and Priya, I'd just like to bring the, you into this as well. Do you think the, U the United Kingdom should stay in Europe, or it should leave it altogether, and would it be better off if it did? I think that's a, a, a false question. I think what, what most people are concerned about is being tied to an international economic system where they are essentially helpless and, and for which, for the excesses of which, for the corruption of which they have to pay. So I think that when we talk about people wanting to leave Europe or wanting to uh, separate, what I think the, the person on the street who you referred to earlier wants is to not be hostage to a system which benefits a handful of people who make all the financial decisions who gain all the benefit while the rest of us uh, pay the price. And I think that's what people want to secede from, uh, not this or that entity in, in, in particular. Uh, ben, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. You hear people talking about um, how the UK needs to regain its sovereignty over its own affairs. But I think, if anything, this, this financial crash has, crash has proved that um, sovereignty is not dictated by whether or not we're part of the UK. Both of you have brought up one excellent point, which is the connection between power and uh, decision making, and the feeling of helplessness, helplessness that, that you mentioned. Um, with the efforts being made by the current government to quote unquote claw back power from Brussels, which is in some cases indirectly elected or appointed, um, to their sort of the home parliaments, or at least to a, more, to a more national level where elected officials make these decisions rather than those in Brussels. Do you think that's essentially a good thing? Do you think it's, an, it's a reaction to what we've gone through over the past few years? Um, I think all this uh, talk about Brussels is uh, displacement activity for a government that is not particularly democratic in the way it works. This is a government, you have to remember, with a mandate cobbled together by putting two parties in there. This is not a government that anybody voted for. Mm -hmm. This is not a government that came in with a huge majority. So when it talks about democracy, uh, I have to take that with a huge pinch of salt, and I have to ask uh, whether this is actually uh, a displacement, uh, blaming Brussels for undemocratic actions that are really taking place already at the heart of government. Mm -hmm. Ben, any thoughts on sovereignty yeah. and politics and controlling and clawing back? Well, um, the, uh, the the point that I just made. I mean, what 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 power is there to claw back? I mean, you look at you look at countries all over the world, and the governments are all carrying out exactly the same program right and left. I mean, Greece, the government is nominally socialist, and yet they're imposing the harshest of austerity measures. And the same in this country, despite the fact we have a right-wing government. I mean, so you can talk about sovereignty, but at the end of the day, the way governments behave is dictated entirely by the whims of, of a handful of people, and unelected people in, in financial centres all over the world. So, for the, the larger issue, and, and let's bring in the larger economic uh, environment again. Um, we have an Occupy movement. Who, uh, one may say an Occupy Wall Street movement, Occupy St. Paul's, recently, as of yesterday, Occupy Oakland. 
um, that has been diverse um, in its in its makeup in each country, but seems to reflect generally very similar sentiments. My question is, regarding St. Paul's especially, what right do you think the protesters have to disrupt the day-to-day -day protests, uh, the day-to-day -day workings of the church? And is it right that St. Paul's will inevitably have become a symbol of protest in the United Kingdom? I think what you've seen certainly over the past couple of days is that the protesters were only disrupting the church insofar as the church allowed the protests to disrupt it. Now that we've seen, I think, quite a welcome church reversal on this issue, um, the disruption is absolutely minimal to the workings of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, and I think that the issues that these protests are gathered together to protest about, particularly in the city of London, uh, are incredibly important important issues that, they, that people really need to be focusing on in a wider context of economic policies that may not be yeah. working. Priya and Ben, if, please jump in on, on this issue, which is when we deal with issues like Occupy St. Paul's and the Dale Farm protests, do you think that there is a common thread through all these, or is it more of a localized issues that have outraged just large segments of the population or small segments of the population? I think with the, um, with the Occupy protest, I think, well, to talk in terms of um, disruption to, you know, do they have any right to disrupt the day-to-day -day life um, is, is slightly bizarre um, because given what, given what these people are protesting against, which is the uh, kind of the, the economic crisis like the, the, and the things that have caused it, um, I think what the result of that has been more than just mere disruption to the vast majority of people's lives. So I think um, in that sense, um, the Occupy movements we've seen all over the world obviously have that common thread running through them. And I think it's really important to recognise that they're all linked up in that way. Priya, what are your thoughts as an educator who sort of sees students and, and at the same time sort of bridges the gap um, between so many different people? You're obviously a professor, but you're involved with the students, you're a professional, you're, you're connected obviously to colleagues who are academics, but also people who are professionals and well-educated as well, well-traveled. What, what do you see about this? I mean, is, is this, um, again, um, part of a larger issue, or what is this trying to express? No, absolutely. What I see are, are connections, and it's actually very heartening. I'm in touch with students I taught in the US, I'm in touch with students and people in India who are protesting. I'm in touch with friends in the Middle East and, and, and students here. And what's very clear and what's very uh, amazing is to see the convergence of interests and to see the ways in which people across the world in very different contexts are worried about uh, a system to which they're all held hostage in, in precisely the same way. So I think uh, what I am seeing from, a, from the, the position where I sit is, is connections and people coming together to say, well, actually, um, enough is enough, and it, it really is time to stop uh, the system from, from carrying on. Now, in terms of the system, would you define it mostly as the banks? Would you define it as the government? Would, would you define it as a larger culture of greed? How would you sort of break it down or prioritize? Well, it's option D, isn't it? All of the above. It's, it's part of a, of a systemic problem. We have a system where the banks are the symptom. Uh, of, 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 of greed, and, and greed is really at the heart of the system. And, and I, I saw a very interesting placard from Wall Street which said, you know, the system isn't broken, this is the system. And I think it's, it's really wrong to look at this as a kind of, uh, the way in which uh, even David Cameron is now saying, well, we need to curb excesses. It's not about excesses, it's about a system that is fundamentally skewed against the many and fundamentally uh, turned in the direction of, of, of benefiting uh, quite a few, or just a few. So I think that's what people are challenging. So would you agree with people like Philip Blonde, who says that the, we should remoralize the market? That, uh, no, I think, that's, uh, I think that's, that's sort of uh, somewhat biased talk. I don't think that the market as it currently stands can be remoralized. It is a fundamentally immoral system, and I think we're looking down the jaws of a fundamentally immoral system, and that has to change. Focusing again on a local issue, um, the, the Cambridge Council is presiding over hundreds of job loss amid, amid, amidst the spending cuts, um, have just voted to give a 25% pay raise to, um, to, 
to city councilors. Um, the argument that they would that they made is that by increasing the salary, they make it um, more viable cool, to attract people who traditionally would not be able to live off of such a salary. What are your general thoughts of sort of you look at the numbers, but then you look at the intentions? What's your impression of these? I think situation com the story as it's presented conflates two sets of issues. One is how we pay our representatives, and I happen to think it's important that we pay our representatives enough to live, enough to survive, given that being a councillor and independent of political strife is basically a full time job and receives a part time wage uh, that needs redressing. It conflates that with the cuts imposed by central governments. I think it's perfectly possible, I think as I do, right. to oppose the cuts right. from central government, but support the premise that you need to pay city councillors yeah. enough money. Ben, quick thoughts, we're on our way off. Um, I do obviously think that we need to pay councillors enough, but it's worth looking at the background to, to why they introduced the raise as big as they did, and that's because they commissioned a supposedly independent panel to, to review it, a panel that they have subsequently decided, following um, a protest by Unison and lots of pressure from the unions, um, actually wasn't independent after all. And I think that's, that's quite interesting. Interesting point. Priya, you get the last word. <laughs> what are your thoughts on these? Well, I, I think yeah. that uh, the idea that people should be paid enough for the work they do is something that should apply across the board. And I think this idea that some people should be given pay rises and other people made to take the suffering, I think that is, is the problem. And I think we need to be looking at paying people properly across the board, across society. Well, thank you very much for your time. If there's anything we've learned over these past few weeks, it's that these protests, regardless of your ideological background, represent a real and enduring sentiment among a vast segment of the population, not just in the United Kingdom, but throughout the world. And because it affects so many in so many parts of their lives, past, present, and future, it is increasingly important that we discuss not just the root causes, but the future answers. As one former British Prime Minister said this past week, protest is not policy, and outrage is not an alternative. But if then that is true, what are our alternatives? What are the policy options that will deliver the results? The results of a better way of living, the res results of a better standard of living, the results of a better sense of justice in concrete terms. This is what we will continue to try to answer, to try to explore, and we hope you will join us again for another view from the bridge.